Hi, I'm Alan Davis, the Marketing and Communications Director here at Asian Sky Group and Asian Sky Media. I'm delighted today to have with me uh, two of the finest lawyers in Asia, uh, both from Clyde & Co, both based in Hong Kong. Uh, gentlemen, would you like to introduce yourselves? Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm Stuart Miller, a partner at Clyde & Co in the Hong Kong office. Uh, in the aviation team. Uh, I've been in Hong Kong for over 10 years and I have uh, been working in the aviation finance and leasing industry uh, for approximately 20 years. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Alan, uh, my name is Peter Coles. Um, I'm also a partner at Klein & Co in the global aviation practice. I've been in Hong Kong for a continuous period of uh, over 20 years and also been here earlier in the 1990s and in Singapore. So um, out of UK and Europe for 30 years uh, getting on. My practice is quite uh, broad. I'm not an aviation finance and leasing lawyer, but I do work in uh, the regulatory, commercial, contingency planning and uh, major loss uh, and accident space. Okay, um, we're going to be talking. Sorry, we're going to be talking about risks today. Um, we're going to split the session into effectively two different parts. So we're going to talk about transactional risk first of all, and then later on we'll come on to operational risk. And I believe one of you will take one, and, and one is the other. I think Stuart, you're the you're the transaction risk expert here. Um, so one of the things that we've seen over the course of the last year, especially, are a lot of new people coming into business aviation. Are there a lot of risks involved that, that, that people like that don't originally realize? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question to start with, Alad. Um, transaction execution and process risk uh, is, is a favorite topic of mine, actually. Um, and from a general perspective, there is a common theme um, uh, that new entrants or first-time buyers uh, do actually uh, suffer the same general process issues and risks on their first jet transactions. Um, essentially, their first jet transaction is, is basically a real learning experience for them. Um, now, that sounds like a little bit of a simple answer, but it's actually a serious point because by definition, a new entrant or a first-time buyer simply hasn't bought or financed aircraft before. And so primarily they simply don't know what to expect. And so naturally they perhaps underestimate the scope and complexities um, and maybe the timetable of what is actually involved in purchasing or financing aircraft. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a flippant um, uh, comment, but time and time again, people do make reference to first time buyers thinking that buying an aircraft or financing an aircraft is like buying or financing a car. Uh, and of course, all of us in the industry know that that is simply not correct. Um, if I could just add one point to, to that general observation um, is that of course there is good news for the, the new entrant or the, new, um, the, the first time buyer, uh, which is that within the industry, most of the reputable jet brokers, the jet managers, the jet financiers, um, obviously the OEMs uh, and experienced aircraft advisors are actually very, very good at supporting first time buyers. Um, so the support is there for them um, if they want it. And, and going a bit deeper into that, are there any sort of typical um, problems that can come up during that process? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, there are common pressure points, uh, which we we often recognize, um, not just with first time buyers, but with uh, repeat buyers or um, experienced uh, industry participants as well. Um, those pressure points are usually to do with alignment pressures, um, aligning timings, aligning information flow, um, and aligning the multiple parties. Uh, so perhaps if we if we you know, step back a little bit, we all understand that uh, corporate jet transactions usually have a level of commercial pressure uh, and, and perhaps some negotiation tactics can be expected. Uh, but when it comes to process risks, there are just so many moving parts that having everybody involved in the transaction on the same page 
is fundamental to ensuring that the transaction all works together to mitigate the risk that different parts of the transaction might actually fall apart. So aligning timing pressures is an absolute key one. Are the parties' timing expectations realistic? Um, and particularly whether the, the practical considerations to do with the aircraft timings um, have been properly thrashed through. So is the, is the uh, uh, inspection facility booked? Is it, is it available? Can they get the aircraft into it? Uh, is there physical access to the aircraft in the first place, uh, both the aircraft and the records, of course, um, and, and issues like aircraft mobility for closing purposes, uh, practical issues. Um, and then the parties themselves, of course, often have different timing considerations. Um, and although in our industry, moving fast on transactions uh, is, is always important, in the current environment, speed can be absolutely crucial uh, where the pandemic pressures are affecting one or more of the parties in different ways. Um, and then as I, as I mentioned as well, aligning information uh, and aligning third parties, uh, other, other real pressure points. There are just so many parties involved in corporate jet transactions. Uh, not only do you have your new entrant uh, buyer, uh, and of course it's counterparty seller, but Typically, there are financiers who, you know, potentially is financi financiers on both sides. Uh, you have your managers, potentially also different managers on both sides. Uh, you have your MSP providers. Uh, often, they may be the same on both sides, but potentially different. Uh, OEMs, escrow agents, corporate service providers, your councils, various advisors, etc. And And the key point here, I guess, is that there are so many parties, so many moving parts. To effectively manage the process, you need alignment and you need to mitigate the alignment pressures. And is that with so many different um, moving parts in the transaction, like you just said, is, is, is alignment of everybody the best way to manage risks? Uh, it's certainly one of the, one of the ways to manage the risks. Um, uh, I, I guess it comes down to education, planning, and communication. Uh, the education aspect obviously depends on the circumstances and where you fit into the transaction. Um, but if you are on the side of a first time buyer, then obviously helping them understand in advance what it is that they're getting into and how the process works is pretty fundamental to avoid surprises for them later. Um, I think your point really goes to planning uh, and mitigating the risk can be achieved mainly, I feel, through planning, 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 and more planning, uh, because it provides the best chance of overall success. Every transaction twists, uh, has multiple twists to it. But as long as you have a starting structure and a starting plan, uh, then parties can adapt to those twists and be flexible in uh, evolving circumstances while not losing sight of their objectives or, or their original success plans. Um, and so uh, that, I guess, leads us to my third point, which was communicating. And I think one of the key points to mitigating process risks is constant communication. Um, communication on your own side of the transaction, make sure all of your parts are aligned, uh, but also communication on the other side of the transaction and with the third parties, particularly to ensure that progress is being made as you expect it to be made, um, and to check in with them, um, regular updates and, and limit a late notice of any surprises. Um, it, may, it may sound quite easy to actually say these sorts of things, but actually having a transaction management process and a system in place at the beginning and actually using, implementing that system um, is, to my mind, one of the, the key ways that the process risk can be managed. Okay. And so we mentioned earlier on um, new, new time buyers, uh, first time buyers, sorry, coming into the market, sort of not knowing what to expect. And then we sort of touched upon education and stuff like that. How do you sort of communicate with a, a first time buyer or maybe somebody that hasn't bought aircraft too often in the past? 
how are they likely to know who does what during a transaction? Because you mentioned there are A, so many moving parts, but then there are B, so many different people involved in this state, this, this transaction. I'm just wondering how, if there is, because presumably you can't just give somebody a list and say, look, here's, here's, here's who does what, because that list is going to be quite long anyway. Yeah, you're exactly right. That list is is long, but you, you've actually hit uh, one of the key points. So to begin with, speaking, talking to people and actually explaining things is is also fundamental. Um, checklists and, and lists of point for them to consider are also very, very important. But talking to them to begin with, giving them a broad overview and answering questions. Uh, yeah, absolutely answering their questions, figuring out what they think they already know, what they really do know, and where the gulf of information actually lies, so that you can go about trying to fill that gulf of information um, at the beginning. Um, then in terms of who does what, um, the, the idea of checklists and a transaction management plan is also fundamental. Um, and to the extent that it's possible to have a, uh, say a kickoff call where all parties are uh, represented and just discuss, communicate um, who is going to do what. Um, one of the key parts of that is, is that it might not actually matter who is doing it, but the fundamental point is to check that somebody is doing it and making sure that all the parties are on the same page. Uh, so, so the method of communicating is uh, I, I'm a, a fan of speaking um, and dialogue uh, as well as using uh, documentation processes uh, in order to uh, keep everyone honest, I guess. And I guess it must be quite daunting for a first time buyer as well, having not gone through this process. You, you mentioned sort of uh, liking things to buying a car or something like that. Um, because of course, it, it's nothing like that at all. You can walk into a showroom, buy a car, and then a couple of months later have it delivered. It's nothing like that at all. So I'm just wondering how, how a first time buyer would, would feel and, and certainly feel overruled with all of this different information that's coming, coming to them. Yeah, that, that certainly does happen. Um, and, and I guess that, that goes back to one of the very earlier points that we did make. Um, and, and one of the parts that they start to really understand, um, notwithstanding the fact that there's been some explanation in advance, is when they start to see the volume and density of documentation. Uh, now, obviously, it depends on particular transactions, but let's take a purchase, which is also financed, um, and all of the documentation flies in at about the same time. Um, it can be extremely daunting. Um, and, and they can underestimate the personnel resources uh, that they actually need in order to effectively um, review and execute that documentation. Now, the advisors uh, on their side are obviously helping them with that and are there to support them with it. But at the end of the day, they really do need to understand uh, what they are letting themselves in for and, and where their pressure points and where their risks may be and what it's going to mean to own and finance that aircraft. So, uh, yes, you're quite right. Uh, it can be daunting. Uh, you just need to uh, support to the extent uh, that they need it. And, and if, the, if the risks during a transaction um, aren't, aren't taken care of very well, what, what are the consequences? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong during a <laughs> transaction? Um, well, it never, if it's not properly managed, speaking about process risk, um, then it never turns out to be a good thing. Um, something will always go wrong. Um, and when it does, it can go wrong spectacularly. Uh, at a minimum, typically time or cost expectations won't be met. Um, Perhaps the ultimate consequence is a completely failed transaction, although uh, that is not as common um, as you as you might expect. And what is more likely is that the primary transaction itself will eventually get done. Uh, but in addition to time or budget blowouts, like I mentioned, 
there's bound to be an unhappy customer in some respect uh, and quite likely some type of unworkable aspect to the transaction, which might lead to the risk that either the customer feels they got a bad deal uh, or just had a bad experience, um, or perhaps part of the transaction, for example, um, uh, the, the financing that accompanies the purchase, that might need further amendment or restructuring after the fact. Uh, but probably one of the most likely consequences, I guess, is that the transaction requires some level of ongoing follow-up uh, and, and the whole thing just extends on and on, uh, which incurs greater time and costs and brings us back to the idea of an unhappy customer. Absolutely. So basically what you're saying is a, a lawyer is a first-time buyer's best friend? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Alongside their, uh, their technical advisors and, and their managers uh, and their financiers, of course. Um, but we, we certainly try to be first-time buyer's best friends. Perfect, perfect. And and so there's a second part to this as well, because of course, once once the aircraft is in service, there are operational uh, risks involved with that aircraft as well. And I think, Peter, this is your sort of area of expertise. Yes, uh, I wouldn't call myself a, um, a pilot or an engineer, but certainly from a legal and risk perspective, that's correct. And so, I mean, it's an obvious question based on uh, the year that we had last year with with the pandemic. Had it caused many problems on on your end of the business? Well, I think you know, if I just start from the kind of pu general public perspective, and that is that you know we've all seen a massive reduction in flight operations. We've seen the grounding of aircraft. We've seen a very significant uh, reduction in the number of people employed in the industry. Um, those are all in the in the eyes of the public, and of course, people can't travel from country to country. From a corporate jet or business aviation perspective, in the early stages of the pandemic, we saw a lot of people taking corporate jets to other locations, uh, either for holidays or to conduct board meetings, or to or to park them remotely. Um, but as the pandemic went on, their ability to fly to uh, a favorable jurisdiction um, became diminished or was stopped altogether. So in addition to those images of commercial airliners being placed into remote parking in airports or more significantly into boneyards around the world, you know, in this region that was Australia and certain other countries, uh, so surely did we find uh, business jets being parked remotely and in some cases in different countries from where they were. And it must be remembered that, of course, for some owners of corporate jets, um, they weren't flying them very often in any event, you know, compared with the commercial airline market. Some owners do not want their aircraft chartered out. So it, you, you've had this sort of knock-on effect of, perhaps not using them very often uh, to a situation where they're not using them at all. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, sorry. Ca sorry, Karen. No, no, no. After you, please. So I, I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is that, uh, you know, in, in obviously if you're living in a country with a large, uh, a large country, many islands, uh, then you, you may well have been able to fly. Um, but if you're in a locality like Hong Kong, then it's, it's very difficult very difficult. So I, I'm aware from the jet managers here that most of the flying that has taken place recently has either, either been um, takeoff and landings uh, within the same departure and destination, or has been flying within mainland China. I, um, it's funny as you said, I did my three week quarantine in a hotel overlooking the airport. And I'd quite often see G650s, Global 6000s, just basically bashing the circuit for a couple of hours. I guess they're trying to keep uh, pilots keeping recurrent, keeping the engines running on, on the aircraft. But as, as flights do resume, um, what are the possible risks involved? Well, I think, I think the starting point here is, is how you get aircraft back into operation. And what we've seen, if, if you think about how things emerged during last year, you know, we had the initial period, February, March, April, May, lockdowns and the like 
in many countries. And then we had a sort of resurgence of flight operations uh, as some of those lockdowns um, uh, you know, were abandoned. Um, but of course, we've gone back down into lockdowns. So if you've had an aircraft that has been parked in a remote area, um, the chances are that some of those engine runs that you've spoken about happening at Chet Black Cock have not actually taken place. Um, some of the requirements under OEM aircraft maintenance manuals have not taken place. So if you think about remote fields and what lives in those remote fields, uh, whether that be rodents, insects, other type of animals, um, you'll, you'll often find that actually they, they have penetrated the aircraft and they've gone about their business to eat what they want. Um, and this happened pre-COVID, but, but during COVID, we know that wildlife has really, really blossomed. So if, if, you, if you face one of those scenarios, actually you may not be able to start the engine or the avionic system may not work or the hydraulic system may not work and therefore your aircraft is going nowhere uh, quickly. Getting aircraft physically out of uh, remote locations where, the, uh, where they're not sitting on tarmac uh, they may be sitting on grass fields or sand, and that does that, apply to business jets as well. Um, simply pulling them out or pushing them out of their, um, where they're parked is problematic. People often fail to appreciate how delicate aircraft are, and those landing gears uh, or main landing gears are not only delicate, but they're very expensive uh, to replace. And the world does not have a, a large supply uh, of, this, of this equipment. Then you've got the whole issue of, um, uh, you know, say you are able to um, commence the engines and the avionics and so on and, and, and uh, return the aircraft to flight. You may find that the period of inactivity or the exposure which the aircraft have had uh, to the environment means that there have been leaks or both external and internal damage or things may have fallen off or there's been substantial corrosion. So your, your darling aircraft may not be so uh, once you're actually able to get it um, in the air because what we're seeing is a lot of aircraft returning very shortly after takeoff with, with major problems um, attached to it. Then you have to look at the whole issue of, you know, what have the crews been doing during this downtime? Um, you know, we've seen that even those lucky pilots who were flying last year, uh, we've seen some uh, erosion in some of their skills. Um, it, it's not like riding a bike. It's not like getting onto a surfboard. Uh, these are complex engineering marvels and you need, uh, you need sufficient technical skills as pilots to operate them. So we've seen some very unstable approaches uh, and we've seen other problems emerging uh, in flight. Uh, and, and, and some of those incidents have actually resulted in, in accidents, either in flight or on the ground, uh, and on occasions, fatalities as well as aircraft damage. So it is inevitable uh, as we go forward, that as flights resume, aircraft get returned, uh, that there will be incidents and accidents either in flight or on the ground uh, because people ha have not either had recurrence training or the retraining may be in fixed simulators or if you look at ground crew, um, it may be people have been out of work for a long time or they have shed the most experienced and senior people because this is an opportunity to do that in order to to reduce your cost base. But how do they? How do people go about uh, mitigating those risks then? Well, I mean, interestingly, you know, some of the comments that Stuart has made this morning in the context of transactional risks are are of a paramount importance. Communication, planning. You know, we we are currently in a once in the generation opportunity to make sure that people are trained to very high standards, that 
old ways of doing things which have the potential of creating problems are rooted out uh, forever or as best as, as we can. Um, and that companies who may have cut back on training and expenditure on looking at procedures should reinvest uh, for the future. Because if they can't resume operations quickly and safely, the, then they will have their licenses withdrawn from them. So it, 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 it is the, the, the whole aspect of uh, expenditure, training and safety is, is of paramount importance and connected with that because there will be a rush to return to operations soon. Um, there's probably a requirement to artificially slow down procedures to ensure that they are conducted properly uh, and correctly and in a safe manner. And then finally, there's again an opportunity here for all stakeholders to be reviewing um, the terms upon which they contract with each other. We've, we've seen in the last year, um, in, re in relation in particular to hangar incidents and push and tow incidents, that the language of the contracts is often ambiguous. Sometimes there are multiple contracts in play for the event with people not having envisaged that this would happen. And in some cases, insurance is not available to a system. So again, you know, the, the crises present opportunities and opportunities, you're given the time to review uh, existing practices uh, and to remedy them as best you can. Absolutely. So in transactional risk and also operational risk, the key points are uh, communication, planning, and a good lawyer. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think we'll, we'll end it there, if that's okay, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.